In this video, we will discuss the story of one of the most controversial drugs ever, Biogen's Adohelm for Alzheimer's disease. We'll tell the story of the drug by analyzing what drove all of these big changes in stock price, and in the process, we'll learn more about interpreting clinical data and understanding how clinical data affects the regulatory process and ultimately the market potential for a drug. So we'll jump right into it with this first big change in stock price here. Uh, so in March of 2019, Biogen dropped, uh, lost $30 billion in market cap, which to put that in perspective, it's two lifts is equivalent to $30 billion. So what happened is that they announced that they were discontinuing the phase three program for aducanumab and Alzheimer's disease. So they were conducting two phase three studies, the Engage study and the Emerge study, to basically see if aducanumab um, could slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a big deal because Alzheimer's is one of the biggest untapped markets in pharma. There are over 6 million patients in the U.S. with Alzheimer's. And at the time of this press release, there were no drugs approved to slow the progression of the disease. And at a price of $20,000 a patient a year, which is sort of a back of the envelope, what you might expect a drug like this to command in the market if it worked, that's a total annual market size of over $100 billion. And they were in phase three with this program. So this is pretty close to being approved. Um, they've been through some of the most difficult parts of the drug development process, and they're kind of on the doorstep of approval and accessing that massive market. So the announcement that this program stopped was a huge disappointment. But it shouldn't have been a surprise. So every other major phase three program in Alzheimer's uh, had failed. There were no approved drugs to stop to slow the progression of the disease for a reason. It's, it's really tough, uh, tough biology. Um, so all of these were large phase three studies run by big pharma companies generally in a variety of patient populations. And all of these drugs didn't work. They were either not effective or they weren't safe or, or both. So they all focus on the same biology, which is the same biology that Biogen targeted. And that is the amyloid hypothesis. So for the last few decades, this has been the most prominent theory as to the cause of Alzheimer's. And there's a fairly large body of evidence supporting the hypothesis, but there's a lot of holes in the, the hypothesis as well. Uh, so without getting into too much detail, we'll go through a quick overview of the amyloid hypothesis here, just to provide some context. Uh, but basically, researchers observed that there were these protein clusters in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. And they found that these clusters were made up of bunches of amyloid beta protein. So they found that this protein had actually played a role in other diseases as well, other neurological diseases like Down syndrome. And Down syndrome often leads to Alzheimer's. Uh, so that further strengthened this uh, potential connection between these amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's disease. And then when people started to study the genetics of Alzheimer's, they found that mutations in a gene called APP, or amyloid precursor protein, were strongly linked to Alzheimer's. And amyloid precursor protein, as the name suggests, is connected to amyloid beta. In fact, APP is a transmembrane protein, and when it is uh, processed by a few proteases, uh, it does actually become amyloid beta. These amyloid beta proteins can clump up together to form these amyloid plaques. So there are these mutations in APP that affect the way and the rate that APP is processed in amyloid beta. So it definitely makes sense to ask whether these plaques cause Alzheimer's. Of course, it's not a perfect hypothesis. Uh, one of the main objections is that there are actually a lot of patients who have these plaques but don't have disease. So there's not a great correlation between the plaques and disease. Um, people who are, you know, proponents of the amyloid hypothesis would say things like, you know, a lot of these people who have plaques but no disease may be just in the early stages of Alzheimer's, but there's still no definitive uh, response to this particular objection. Um, so all of the Alzheimer's studies we mentioned earlier tested this hypothesis, the amyloid hypothesis, um, by seeing if drugs that cleared amyloid beta do in fact improve cognition. And they all failed. A lot of the studies did in fact show um, reduction in amyloid beta plaques, but none of them were able to uh, definitively show that they slowed progression of Alzheimer's disease. And Biogen study did not improve cognition either. Uh, so right now we're gonna look at why exactly we, um, we, we know that uh, the Biogen study does not improve cognition in Alzheimer's. So we're gonna go through the primary and secondary endpoints from the ENGAGE study, which is the phase three study in Alzheimer's um, that ultimately led Biogen to, uh, to stop these programs. And we're just gonna take a, uh, this is an opportunity to learn a little bit more about how to interpret clinical data and some basic concepts that go into um, seeing what a study's results actually mean. So we're gonna go through this, this particular table here and just de define all of these terms and understand how the study was designed so we can interpret this data 
um, and come to our own conclusions about what it means. So we're going to start here with these these rows here. So these represent the endpoints, uh, select endpoints of the study. So the primary endpoint is CDRSB, which stands for clinical dementia rating, and then SB is just a way of scoring it. So this is a, an established way to measure the severity of dementia. MMSE, uh, the mini mental state exam, is another dementia test. The ADAS-COG-13 is a scale for uh, measuring cognitive function in Alzheimer's. And ADCS, ADL, MCI is a scale that measures the ability of patients who have Alzheimer's with mild cognitive impairment uh, to perform uh, basic tasks of daily living. Um, so we're not going to get into the details of, of these particular scales. Uh, just for now, know that they're validated ways to measure the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's also important to highlight that um, in a lot of neurological or psychological diseases, it's actually important to dig into these uh, these measurement scales and understand what drives them. Because unlike things like uh, objective response rate, for example, which are much more objective and quantitative, for neurological or psychological diseases, it's often a little bit more subjective to measure the progression of disease. So understanding uh, what actually goes into these scales is important. But for now, just know that they're established validated ways to measure the progression of Alzheimer's. So focusing on the primary endpoint, CDRSB, this is a scale where lower is better. So uh, this particular scale is measured on a 0 to 18 scale. If you have 0, you have normal cognitive function. If you're in 16 to 18, you have severe dementia. And if you're in between those levels, then you, you have various degrees of mild or moderate cognitive impairment. Okay, so that's basically a, a quick overview of CDRSB. Um, and now going to the rest of the table, we can see that they're measuring the percent reduction in these endpoints versus placebo. So they're seeing, they have two doses of the drug, the low dose and the high dose, and they're measuring how much these, uh, the drug reduced these endpoints compared to placebo. Uh, even more specifically, if you look at this footnote here, they're measuring the change in these endpoints from baseline, the beginning of the study, to week 78, which they say elsewhere in this presentation is the end of the study. And they're looking at the change from baseline, the beginning to the end of the study and all of these endpoints. And then they're taking the difference in the change from baseline to uh, end of the study for the drug versus placebo. Uh, so the, the upshot is that the negative, if this is a negative percentage, it means that there's less decline uh, in the treated arm. But here we'll just quickly kind of walk through why that is why, and how to interpret this data. So again, we know that lower is better for the CDRSB scale. But let's take two hypothetical patients here and uh, see if we can get a better sense of how to interpret this, the data they're going to report. So take a hypothetical placebo patient with a baseline CDRSB of 5. So um, that's in the mild dementia range. And then at the end of the study, week 78, they have a CDRSB score of 10. So the change from baseline to week 78 in that case is 5. Now we'll look at a hypothetical high-dose patient, also starting with the same baseline CDRSB score of 5. And at week 78, this patient has a score of seven. So that's a two, a change of two uh, from baseline to week 78. So this particular patient who received the high dose um, started the study with mild dementia, and then they ended the study within this mild dementia category, although their score was a little bit higher, seven versus five. The placebo patient did worse. So they started off with mild dementia, and then they ended up having a score of 10, which is moderate dementia. So then we take the difference between those two uh, those two differences of five and two, and we get a percent reduction versus a placebo of sixty percent. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure if this is exactly how they calculated in the study, but based on what they present in the slides, it seems like that uh, is what they did. But that's just to give you a sort of a, a little bit better picture of what uh, we're actually going to be interpreting in terms of these these endpoints here. But before we get to that, let's just go back and walk through the rest of this this slide here. So I mentioned that they tested a low dose and a high dose. Um, the last thing I'll mention on that point is that if you're calling the last video, you want to see a dose response here. So you want to see the high dose has a larger effect on the endpoints than the low dose. And that basically gives you more confidence that any, any change you see um, with the drug arm versus placebo is due to the drug. So if the low dose has a, a bigger effect on the endpoint than the high dose, then that doesn't necessarily give you confidence that the drug is driving that effect. It could be something else. It could be the drug, and there could just be some sort of uh, nuance with the pharmacology. Um, but to, to get more confidence in most cases uh, that the drug is working, the high dose should have a, a bigger response than the low dose. So the, the last bit of context here is these ITT and OTC populations. Um, so you'll often see this in studies. You'll have an ITT or an intent-to-treat population. 
which means uh, this is the population of all patients who entered the study, those that were intended to be treated. And then you'll also often see some sort of subset of that population, like a completer population. And in this case, it's an OTC population, which stands for opportunity to complete. And Biogen defines this elsewhere in the presentation as patients who had the opportunity to complete the week 78 visit, which is the last visit of the study. So patients may be excluded from the OTC um, as you see, it's smaller. This population is smaller than this one. Patients may be excluded from this population because they, you know, violate the protocol. They don't take all the doses. Maybe they drop out of the study. They don't show up for their visits. Maybe they pass away. Um, a number of reasons. But it's very common to include uh, an ITT population and then a subset of that population when you're looking at clinical data. Um, so including both these populations makes sense because including the ITT population better reflects the potential real world use of this drug. So in the real world, you're not gonna have such a controlled setting as a clinical study. You know, patients may miss doses, they may miss visits, they may not receive as much care, and you wanna know how well the drug works out in the wild. But at the same time, if you're doing a study, you really want to isolate um, the drug's effect on the disease, and you don't wanna have all these confounding factors like how well patients adhere to treatment and things like that. Um, so that's why you want to include the OTC population, just to better isolate the drug's effect on the outcomes of, um, that you care about. But you want to include the ITT population because it's unbiased, and it also potentially better reflects the real world. Okay, so that's the context of this chart. And just to summarize, we're looking at the percent change in a patient's cognitive function from the beginning of the end of the study. And we're comparing that change in patients who receive the drug to patients who receive the placebo. Um, so to tie it back to the overall point of this drug, like what does even exist, this drug is meant to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So these endpoints are all related to, uh, the, there are best ways of measuring the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And we're measuring the difference from baseline to at the end of the study because we want to see how the disease progresses um, on drug versus without the drug. So if the drug worked, you would expect cognitive decline to be slower in the patients who receive the drug versus patients who receive the placebo. So as you see here, um, the negative percentage means less decline in the treated arm. And if you see a negative percentage uh, in these cells here, then that means that the drug slowed the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So what did we actually see in this study? So we saw some negative numbers, that's, that's good. But we need to really dig into these numbers in more detail to understand what these actually mean and whether the drug actually works. Um, so the first thing that we'll point out is not all of these numbers are negative. You actually see that for the high dose, um, they're positive numbers for the CDRSB and the MMSC. So what that means is that the high dose actually um, made patients worse than placebo, uh, which is never a good thing. The low dose, all these numbers are negative, which you'd expect or which you would hope for. But in the high dose, that's not the case. And in fact, the the high dose is about, is about just as bad uh, or worse than the low dose, which is not encouraging. Because remember, we want to see a dose response. We want to see a higher dose have a higher impact on the endpoint than the low dose does. So that should first jump out at you as potentially uh, concerning. Um, the fact that there's no dose response and the fact that you do see some you know, nominal worsening of the these endpoints with the high dose. The thing that should really uh, make you a little bit skeptical or a lot skeptical is looking at the p-values here. Um, so underneath these percentages uh, shows the p-value of these particular findings. So if you're not familiar with uh, the concept of p-values or statistical significance, we'll just go through that quickly here. If you are familiar with that, you've probably already you know, drawn the conclusion that the study failed um, and can fast forward a little bit. But for those who aren't familiar with it, it's really important to understand the concept of statistical significance. So in general, um, statistical significance is a way to determine whether a particular result is is real um, or how much confidence you can have that a particular result in this case reflects that a drug is better than placebo versus just being some random variability or uh, some confounding factors so in general in drug development you're looking for a p-value of less than like 0.05 and that's considered statistically significant significant and it varies depending on the endpoint point in the study sometimes you want to see a p-value of 0.0005 or 0.001 or whatever but um, oftentimes 0.05 is considered statistically significant. Um, and what statistical significance does is it measures how likely it is that you would see a particular result, like how likely it is if you did a study, how likely would you see a 12% decrease in uh, um, uh, the 
the progression of Alzheimer's with the low dose for placebo if the null hypothesis was true. And in this case, the null hypothesis is that the drug is as effective as the placebo. So in a world where this drug is basically just a placebo, how likely is it for you to see a 12% slowing of cognitive decline uh, with this low dose? And the probability is reflected by the p-value. So here, if we assume the null hypothesis is true, that this drug is a placebo, there's a 24% probability of observing at least a 12% difference between the drug and the placebo. So that's that's fairly high. I mean, is that too high? Is it not high enough? So that's why we have this uh, the p-value threshold that we often define as 0.05. And um, you want to see that your p-value is less than whatever your pre-specified threshold for statistical significance is. Um, so if you have a low p-value, that means it would be very unlikely to observe a particular result if the drug and placebo were the same. So you can reject the null hypothesis. Um, and the first thing that you'll note here is all these p-values are pretty high. So there is a fairly significant probability that you'd see all of these results if the drug was the same basically as a placebo. And when they actually do these studies, they have a predefined statistical result that they'd want to see to see if the study succeeds or failed. If they had a p-value of less than 0.05 on the primary endpoint for this study, then that would probably be uh, success in the primary endpoint. But if it's not statistically significant change in progression of diseases measured by CDRSB, then that means the study failed. So based on these p-values, this study just failed. Um, that this drug, you can't conclude that the drug is any better than placebo. And then when you look at things like there's not a dose response and that you actually have a nominal increase, although it's not statistically significant with the high dose on CDRSB and the MMSC uh, scale, that's not a pretty picture. So all of this data suggests to us that this drug doesn't really work. And that's why they, uh, they, can't, they cancel the development program based on these results. But wasn't that expected? Going back to the change in stock price, as we discussed earlier, stock prices are based on expectations. And if all the prior studies targeting the amyloid hypothesis had failed, wouldn't investors have expected this study to fail as well? And if so, then why was there such a big drop in stock price? So it turns out that Biogen actually did another phase three of aducanumab in Alzheimer's and the results were positive. So in 2018, they presented results from the eMERGE study, which is the second big study they did of this drug in Alzheimer's, and that appeared to be positive. So this is an analogous chart to the one we just looked at for Engage. Um, and this one actually shows that the high dose achieves a significantly, statistically significant um, reduction in the progression of Alzheimer's as measured by CDRSB compared to placebo. So these are uh, lower p-values that are less than the 0.05 threshold that you wanna see for statistical significance. You also see a dose response. So there's um, better reduction of cognitive decline in the high dose versus the low dose in both the ITT and the OTC population. And all these numbers are negative, which is good. You know, ideally, you know, you'd want to see this be statistically significant as well in the low dose. But, um, you know, based on the, the fact that this is statistically significant at the high dose and, the dose and there is a dose response, and that's a pretty strong piece of evidence um, supporting uh, the, the hypothesis that this drug works. And we won't look at the secondary endpoints as well, but the results were, were pretty similar and pretty encouraging. And this is a pretty large study. Um, this was a, a similar size to the ENGAGE study. It was a randomized placebo-controlled study, uh, well-designed. So the fact that you see these results in such a study is a strong piece of evidence that supports the hypothesis that this drug works in Alzheimer's disease. However, given the number of prior failed studies, this one piece of evidence is a long way from definitive. Um, so you should interpret this with caution, uh, but investors still believed in the program based on these results to the, turn of, to, to the tune of $30 billion. Um, and it actually looks like they were somewhat justified based on what happened uh, here and later in 2019. Um, so we will actually look at this in the, the next video. We're gonna stop from here because this was sort of a, a dense video. Um, but in the next video, we'll talk about what, what happened on, on this date and why the stock jumped so much. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, if you were confused or anything wasn't clear, just let me know if there's questions in the comments. And I will put another video out probably in the next week that continues the story by analyzing this stock change here.